More than a year after the start of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, we're still without a vaccine that's been shown to be safe and effective. And the same is true for many other infections. That's in part because vaccine development is difficult and expensive, and pharmaceutical companies don't always have incentives to produce vaccines that don't have a large market potential. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Stanley Plotkin, an emeritus professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Plotkin has co-authored a perspective article on a potential strategy for boosting the development of needed vaccines. Dr. Plotkin, what's changed in the world of vaccine development? Why are we now at a point where many pharmaceutical companies don't see vaccine manufacturing as a profitable enterprise? There are a number of reasons for the change. One of them is that the targets that we have many of them anyway, are more complex than the targets for which vaccines were developed previously. Now, of course, I can only mention HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis, but there are other vaccines which have proven difficult to make. But the second reason is essentially an economic reason, that the cost of development has risen considerably since the days when I was developing vaccines. So that now, realistically, it takes somewhere between $500 million and a $1 billion to develop a new vaccine. Well, obviously, only a limited number of organizations have that kind of money. And to make matters worse, the number of major manufacturers has been decreasing. So that at the moment, we only have four major vaccine manufacturers that can afford that kind of money. And they have to be convinced that there will be a market return on their investment. So we need ways of making or getting to license vaccines that are not primarily attractive to major vaccine companies. You write in your article that by 2009, there were at least seven Ebola vaccines that had been tested in monkeys with encouraging results, but that only one of those was then tested in healthy humans before the West African epidemic broke out. Was that lack of progress solely the result of this limited funding, or were there other contributing factors? Well, I think it was largely due to the limited funding. The Vaccine Research Center at NIH was the developer that I think was furthest ahead. And they, in fact, did a phase one trial of one of the vaccines, which for reasons I won't go into immediately, the vaccine was abandoned, that particular vaccine. But there were others that were promising. But at that point, the idea was that Ebola was a relatively rare disease and that you couldn't predict where it would occur, and therefore there was no interest in carrying the experimental vaccines from preclinical to, if not licensed, at least vaccines that had proof of concept and could be rapidly manufactured in case of need. So the Ebola is an example. A MERS is another of vaccines that should be ready for deployment, but which are not because of the factors that I mentioned, the economic factors and the relatively small number of vaccine developers. So with the vaccine development fund that you're proposing, requests for support would be reviewed by an independent panel of scientists and funders. You say that Ebola, for example, is a rare disease. So how would that panel prioritize these projects? It was a rare disease. Of course, it's not rare now. And that is essentially what one has to take into account, that rare infections can become common. And so I would say that an Ebola vaccine would have been attractive to develop because it's a virus with a high mortality And it's an example of the filoviruses, which are numerous, that is, which exist in nature, and therefore developing a vaccine against one of them would have contributed to the ability to develop vaccines against others if they became epidemic. So the idea is to be prepared in a better way for diseases that are apparently rare, but which could become more common. 
A chikungunya is another example. It started out as a relatively confined African disease, and now is worldwide. In your model, after initial backing from the Vaccine Development Fund, the more costly phase, the phase three trials, would have to be funded and conducted by pharmaceutical partners. And you suggest that that would be with substantial government support or special incentives. So in your model, how would the companies be attracted to the projects? And then once successful, would there be any restrictions or limits on the profits that the companies could make? Would there be any repayment? Well, those are good questions, and I'm not sure I can satisfactorily answer them. But one point is that a phase three trial is only possible in the event of an outbreak. So the point that I'm making is that you can't go ahead and test for efficacy or safety in large numbers, for that matter, until you have an opportunity. But on the other hand, if you're not ready to go, that opportunity is lost, as it was in Ebola. So the phase three trials would be contingent on there being a demonstrated need. But again, if you're ready to go, it makes all the difference to getting good data. As far as the economic returns, that is a complex issue. And just again, taking Ebola as an example, I think that has been demonstrated with Ebola that governments and donors would be willing to pay for a successful vaccine, would be willing to recompense a company that had done the phase three trial because it would make sense in terms of saving money in health costs. So there would be an economic value to doing it and an economic value to paying a company to do a phase three trial. You note in your article that only about 20% of vaccine development projects that reach the preclinical phase actually result in a licensed vaccine. That's one of the reasons that vaccine development isn't a popular field. You know, I'm glad you asked that question because I'm correcting the proofs of the article. And I went back to the original reference and discovered that, in fact, the original reference doesn't say 20%. It says 7%. Now, the 20% figure came from an article published in the 1990s, which I misremembered as coming from the more recent paper that's cited in the article. The more recent paper gives a 7% figure. So it's even worse than the 20%. And I think the reasons for that are the more difficult targets and the issue of how much money it takes to move forward. So are there any strategies that researchers can use to predict earlier in the process what might be safe and effective? There are many optimistic ways of determining that or guessing that that's the case, but really I am convinced from experience that until you get into humans, you really can't be sure. So to ask the question in the other direction, in the case of non-licensed vaccines, how far along in development would a vaccine have to be in order to be rolled out during an emergency like the Ebola epidemic? It would have to have gone through a phase one at least, perhaps preferably phase two in which you would have worked out the best schedule and from the point of view of immunogenicity and shown perhaps the best dose. So somewhere in phase two, I think would be sufficient to move ahead into phase three. Finally, have any countries or any other funders expressed interest in setting up something like a vaccine development fund? What are the chances that we'll see some movement in this area? I think the consensus of opinion in the vaccine community that something like this is needed. I hope that there will be some movement. And of course, my hope is that the article will contribute to making people think about this and to move forward on it. Thank you, Dr. Plotkin.